for Q&A time at the end of this webinar. And now that you're all here, I think it's time to begin. So just want to introduce myself to everyone here. My name is Liz Glazer, and I'm a director on the Strategic Initiatives and Partnerships team here at America's Promise. Um, I've been working on the Acceleration Initiative for about two years since I started, and it's really exciting to be here and sharing the lessons learned from the case studies and just elevating all of these amazing um, programs that we've gotten to learn from. So we really hope that you've been having a good summer, and um, that's how we wanted to introduce ourselves. So I'm really excited now to turn it over to my colleague, uh, Monica Kinchelow, who's going to dive a little bit more into the Grad Nation campaign and introduce um, our few panelists. All right, thanks so much, Liz. Um, and thank you to all of you for joining our second webinar in the Grad Nation Acceleration Initiative webinar series. And, and I hope you're joining us after what was a good summer and a, a good start to the school year, all things considered. I think I have to acknowledge that we're living in a time of incredible um, unrest and illness, and um, this is just a year unlike any other. And so, just want to you know acknowledge that and encourage and invite all of our participants in today's webinar to speak to that to the extent that it's um, impacting your work and your life. All right, so with that, I'm Monica Kinchelow, um, as Liz said, and I work with a great team on the Grad Nation campaign at America's Promise. And we're excited to continue sharing the lessons learned and opportunities for next steps from our five acceleration sites as part of this webinar series. <clears throat> Excuse me. Today's agenda is going to start with our partnership with AT&T um, through the Grad Nation Acceleration Initiative. And we are trying to get Callum on the line, so hopefully he can join really soon. Um, and then we'll dive deeper specifically into the lessons learned from these five acceleration sites, specifically related to pathways development with opportunities to learn from our wonderful partner in youth solutions and their premier program, Jobs for Michigan's Graduates. We'll also hear from adults and young people on how COVID is impacting program operations and job placements. Uh, so I just wanna make sure, can you give me a heads up, Liz? or a thumbs up, excuse me, if Callum's on. Okay, great. So Callum is on. I'm really pleased to introduce Callum Butts, the Director of Charitable Operations at AT&T. And he's been a wonderful partner and supporter on the Grad Nation campaign. So Callum, take it away. We can't hear you, Callum. <laughs> Callum, we can see you. We just can't hear you if you're talking. No, we can't hear you. Sorry. Thanks for your patience, everyone. Callum, we're wondering if, um, I want to just use you up the computer audio or the phone audio. Oh, Callum, you're frozen. All right, I'm gonna transition to a little bit more on the Grad Nation campaign and then we'll go in reverse. So we're gonna go from the campaign to um, our, our corporate supports and in reverse order. And so he's gonna, he's gonna try to log in. Thanks for your patience, everyone, on that. So 
what I wanted to do now is just focus a little bit on the campaign, like I said. So the Grad Nation campaign is a national campaign to increase the high school graduation rate to 90% and improve the high school experience that upon graduation, young people are ready for whatever their futures hold. And with AT&T's continued partnership, our, decade, our campaign has, is almost a decade old. In this time, we've developed a deeply held belief in the power of uplifting community-led efforts to support young people to the gateway milestone of graduating from high school. We invest in communities through community summits, innovative program grants, and providing a platform to elevate and share best practices. The case studies earlier this summer reflect lessons learned throughout the two-year partnership with a diverse group of communities across the country. The Acceleration Initiative was born out of years of experimentation and analysis. We conducted a qualitative and quantitative analysis about the efforts that have worked in the past to understand which groups of young people needed support to reach the graduation milestone. We then put out a request for proposals based on that analysis and invited applications from community and statewide efforts across the United States. Applicants were asked to describe programs that included at least two categories of our Grad Nation Action Platform, which you see on the slide now. These six platform areas are based on the collective experience and expertise of individuals at organizations working with young people across the country. It's also based on the experience of young people themselves and through our own research. The areas of the action platform are using high quality data, responding to non academic factors, improving school climate, and strengthening adult relationships, in addition to providing secondary pathways and engaging students who have left without graduating. All right, Kellen, you. I'm just going to wrap this part up and then hand it right back over to you. All right, well, can you, can you guys hear me now? Yes. Okay, all right, all right. Let's go ahead and finish, Monica. Thanks, Kellen. In this way, uh, the, the communities who are highlighted in these case studies result two critical priorities in the national effort to improve graduation outcomes. First, they use evidence-based practice from a whole child's view. And second, they are laser focused on a group of students who need more robust supports than have been provided to date. We believe this is the formula for closing the gap from what is now an 85% graduation rate to a 90% graduation rate. So I'm going to turn it to Kellum to share a little bit more about AT&T's role in this important work nationally. So we'll hand it to you, Kellum. I'm glad we figured okay. it out. Okay. <laughs> yeah. can, all right. Can you, you can hear me now, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, so I, I'm with AT&T and clearly there's a reason I work in the foundation. Uh, it's because my technological savvy is severely lacking. So my, my apologies. Uh, I, I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview about uh, our, our engagement with uh, America's Promise Alliance, how we've been involved, why we've been involved. So in, in 2008, about 12 years ago, uh, AT&T established uh, Aspire. Uh, and Aspire is our largest philanthropic effort. Um, and it's uh, since then, we've invested about $600 million uh, with an intense focus on education and workforce preparedness. Uh, so we joined the, Gra the Grad Nation campaign uh, back then, years ago, largely uh, through the guidance of our CEO at the time, Randall Stevenson. Because at that time, only one in four kids were, were, grad or one in four kids were not graduating with their, their class on time. And we knew that that was going to be a problem uh, in the future as our, our large employee base was starting to retire and our technology was going to be changing. If we didn't have uh, people who were able to fill those jobs for, uh, for those of us uh, starting to, to retire, although I'm not retired, I'm still here. Um, a APA, America's Promise Alliance, really had a, uh, an intense focus on, obviously, on the, the Grad Nation campaign. So we invested uh, with APA back then. Uh, some of the things we did, uh, a number of local engagements to understand uh, local engagements around the country. Uh, I think there were about a hundred of them uh, that we, we really wanted to try to understand what was happening at the, at the ground level. Um, you know, what was lacking? What do we need to do? And really listen to, to people around the country. So we, we did that. Uh, and, and, you know, we've, as, a, as a country, we've seen, we've seen really, really steady progress. 
uh, towards uh, increasing the, 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 the graduation rate. The uh, graduate grad nation acceleration initiative uh, that came about uh, from, from our end, uh, we started to think about this because in 2016, 2017, we started to realize that uh, we were we were falling off track a little bit. Um, so, you know, normally you want to see a, a line going up like that, but it was sort of asymptotic. So it was starting to level off a little bit. So we started to, you know, our, our leader in our organization, head of CSR, really started to, to, to ask the question, what would we do if we alone, AT&T, owned, owned the goal? What would we do to, to address the problem? Uh, so we being the, the smart team we were, we immediately reached out to APA and said, hey, we need help. We need to think through this. So, so what we did is uh, we, we, we thought through it with APA and came up with the, uh, the acceleration um, initiative. And, you know, as, as uh, I was trying to get in, get in, so I don't know how much Monica explained about it, but the, uh, you know, we really focused on the, 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 the key states where we could make the biggest impact. Uh, we, we worked with, uh, you know, APA, ran the, ran the process, figured out the, the most effective uh, programs to really uh, address the, the, the issue. Uh, so that is a, a brief overview of, uh, of our, our engagement with, uh, with, and what's important to us from at and about this work. So at this point, I will hand it back to Liz. Yes, and okay. thank you, Kellum. We're glad glad you got on and the sound is working fine. Um, and that was a great overview of at and commitment to the grad rate goal as well as the acceleration initiative. Um, so I'm gonna just add a little bit more context um, to what you great, uh, introduced so greatly already. So we put out a request for proposal in 2017, asking applicants at the state and community levels to describe their integrated approaches to helping students succeed to high school graduation. In early 2018, we announced the grant recipients for a two-year partnership, and they were Promesa Boyle Heights, who we heard from in July, the Greeley Alternative Program, which is um, in rural Colorado, Mission Graduate out of the United Way of Central New Mexico, and two statewide efforts, which were Project Graduate, um, a partnership between the State Child Welfare Agency and a youth supporting nonprofit working with foster troops in Georgia, and Youth Solutions, and their program, Jobs for Missions Graduates, who we're hearing from today. You will find out a lot more about JMG pretty soon. We did find that even though the strategies across the sites were different and their student groups were different, there were clear commonalities in their approaches across all of the sites. So as we continued to learn from them, we wanted to amplify their stories of progress in a way that drew out those themes, but also showed how the values and practices from those themes can be tailored in your own world, in your own community. The strategies we saw repeated across sites led to the development of three case studies in this um, series that we're now in part two. Each brief in the case study features all five sites from the acceleration cohort and dives deeply into three specific areas of practice. Our first webinar and first case study was about holistic approaches to helping young people succeed. The second was building responsive pathways to graduation and beyond. And the third was creating effective youth supporting partnerships. So today we're focusing on building responsive pathways to graduation and beyond. At the Grad Nation campaign, We've come to define a pathway as a connection to post-secondary opportunity. Two to four year colleges, apprenticeships, internships, or credentialing programs that provide young people with the skills and mindsets that they need to succeed in the career of their choosing. When we refer to responsive pathways, we mean that those post-secondary opportunities are presented to youth in school and as part of their academic learning far um, earlier than the decision to attend college. And the journeys to various careers need to be made clear during their academic experiences. Additionally, we also define pathways as when community employers are connected to schools and youth supporting organizations and help to contribute to an environment that supports young people on their path to employment. So our learnings from these sites showed that every site in the cohort incorporated pathways programming into their in-school and out-of-school time. We learned that building skills for college and career readiness is a foundational element of successfully navigating any post-secondary opportunity. And our site spent a lot of time building skills that were once dismissively labeled as soft skills, but are now understood as critical workplace readiness skills. Skills like critical thinking, 
self-regulation, and conflict management. These pathways, efforts, these pathways efforts, though different in scope, shared several similar elements. These elements were teaching the critical skills and characteristics that are needed to succeed in the workplace, assessing and measuring growth in certain career readiness competencies that include social and emotional skills, and working to develop focused plans for after graduation. We saw that in every program, young people were encouraged to find the post-secondary option that matched their own goals and interests, and they were taught skills and coached accordingly. Our webinar today will explore the pathways-related strategies that the Youth Solutions Program runs at Jobs for Michigan's graduates. So I'm going to turn it back over to Monica, and she'll introduce you to all of our partners from Youth Solutions. Great. Thanks, Liz. I'm excited to introduce you all to Sonia Blanzi, Director of Operations for Youth Solutions, Inc., a nonprofit headquartered in Benton Harbor, Michigan. Youth Solutions offers opportunity pathways to education and employment success, helping nearly 16,000 young Michiganders through their, through their leading jobs for Michigan's graduates programming. Sonia, we're excited to have you and your Michigan-based team on this webinar with us today to share the success that Youth Solutions has with young people across the state. So I want to say uh, welcome to Sonia and the team. And uh, I think Sonia will introduce not only uh, the wonderful adults she works with, but the young people that she works with as well. Yes, thank you, Monica. Um, we're excited to join the conversation today and have been thrilled to partner with APA for the Grad Nation Acceleration Initiative. Um, I'm joined for this conversation by two of my colleagues, including a fellow Youth Solutions leader, um, Elizabeth Bernard and Ryan Fewens Bliss, Executive Director for the Michigan College Access Network. And then, as you mentioned, most excitingly, I think, um, we're joined by two of our Jobs for Michigan's graduates youth, um, Mike Kirby and Hannah Beck. So I'm, I'm really excited to um, get the conversation going with them as well. Um, as you so kindly noted in your introduction, Youth Solutions has been proud to serve Michigan's most economically and socially vulnerable young people through our leading Jobs for Michigan's Graduates programming with a 13-year history of changing lives across our great state. Jobs for Michigan's Graduates, or JMG, as it is affectionately known, um, is a state affiliate of the National Jobs for America's Graduates, or JAG, organization. As a recent USA Today op-ed by JAG National Chairs and Governors John Bell Edwards and Kim Reynolds noted, the 37 JAG National Network, 37 state JAG National Network has had highly vulnerable youth graduate and successfully transi transition to the workforce or post-secondary education for more than 40 years with post-graduation follow-up and support to ensure youth secure good jobs leading to good careers. JMG got its start in our headquarter community of Benton Harbor, where the local high school graduation rate for 2018 and 2019 was 46%, and youth unemployment post-COVID has soared to an unbelievable high of 33%. By contrast, the graduation rate among uh, the youth in Benton Harbor JMG program was 92%, and 91% of the youth experienced a positive outcome 12 months after graduating. What it started as 76 young people in Benton Harbor, in a Benton Harbor classroom has grown to 3,000 lives changed annually all across Michigan. Our youth typically have several barriers to education and employment and are still experiencing success in graduating and transitioning into post-secondary education, the military, or employment. JMG has offered a nonprofit support system that helps young people develop the life skills necessary for education and employment success each year, 11,000 youth leave high school without graduating, yet 77% of available jobs require a diploma as a base requirement. JMG works to change this. We offer two different models for youth who are currently in school and have a model to recover youth who have disconnected from education. No matter what model a youth participates in, the role of the specialist is vital to the success of our program. Our specialists build strong relationships through mutual trust and respect and by creating a safe environment for our youth. Our in-school specialists are typically certified teachers uh, delivering competency-based curriculum through project-based learning and JMG is offered as an elective course as part of the regular school day. 
Our specialists work with youth who have left high school, typically, or our specialists who work with the youth who have left high school, typically deliver services one-on-one -on -one or in small groups, helping the youth as they work towards their high school diploma or equivalent, while also providing real-world skills and competencies. Our JMG specialists use project-based learning, and you can typically see youth taking an active role in the classroom. For example, at our Benton Harbor High School, youth participate in mock interviews. Half of the class asks one student different interview questions, and the other half um, provide the interviews with or interviewee with um, one strength and an area for improvement. This allows students to gain confidence when being interviewed while also practicing giving and receiving feedback, communication, and public speaking. Some of those soft skills or success skills as we like to call them. JMG, um, JMG's results include eight consecutive years of graduation rates that are 90% or higher for all high school programming with 94% graduation rate from the class of 2019 an average statewide graduation rate that exceeds the state average by 12% over a five-year period, and 85% or more of our graduates going on to employment, post-secondary education, or the military annually since 2013 and 2014. Our work as a member of the Grad Nation Initiative has focused on all six of APA's action platform areas, including high quality data, non-academic factors, school climate, caring adult relationships, youth re-engagement and pathways. While each of these action platforms remain important going forward, we have a growing awareness that pathways are going to be the difference maker in ensuring our young people participate meaningfully in the post-COVID economy. The realities for youth post-COVID are stark. Youth unemployment is two and a half times higher than any other generation. And the COVID pandemic has accelerated workforce trends that exclude young people. Job losses among those without any post-secondary education were 3.4 times or 236% higher than those with some form of post-secondary education. If young people are going to participate meaningfully in the post-COVID workforce, they must have a robust understanding of the post-secondary pathways that are available after high school with deep connections to the jobs and industries of interest and the social and emotional skills to succeed. When schools closed in March, all JMG services went 100% virtual. Youth Solutions and JMG converted all of our lesson plans to online and mobile-based formats. JMG specialists, the adults who provide the services, play a significant role in the lives of our youth. Oftentimes, this is the first adult role model and mentor. Many of the specialists became frontline resources steering youth to emergency services, including food and shelter. They increased outreach to the youth, um, working daily to keep them involved in school. In school. Some met with their youth um, in library parking lots, as that was the only place the youth could get stable Wi-Fi connection. They also delivered lesson plans to their homes and created Facebook groups to provide interactive learning. When graduation time came, they celebrated their youth with drive-by parade, photo shoots, and social media congratulations. With the unpredictability of schools this fall, Youth Solutions is ready to work with youth to keep them engaged and focused on their graduation and employment goals. With that, I'm going to hand it over to Kellum so we can hear from two JMG youth and how COVID has impacted their educational experiences and frankly, their lives. All right, uh, thank you, Sonia. Um, okay, so I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna talk a little bit about my, um, my employment journey because that'll help inform our, our discussion with our youth today. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I, I started, uh, for background, I started my career um, in, 1989. So right when I right when I finished college, so I went into college uh, as the as the banking boom was happening. Right. So all of the people I, I went to college with the year a couple of years before me were all working in investment banking, Wall Street. All those jobs were great. By the time I finished, they that that industry had busted. So I, I was uh, wasn't able to go that direction, but I, I did get into uh, I got into sales with Procter and Gamble. Um, after I was there for for a while in different different uh, companies and different sales positions, uh, and I, I wasn't crazy about it, uh, but I, I stuck with it. So after about ten years, I was able to go back to grad school uh, to to get my MBA. Um, again, I started at the mid, in the at the kind of the peak 
of the dot-com boom and finished in the trough of the dot-com bust. So uh, at that time when I, when I finished, opportunities were, were not broadly there, but I was lucky enough to get a position with uh, what was at the time uh, SBC, so um, uh, part, of, uh, part of AT&T. Uh, so I went into a uh, position in, in product management, um, and it was, it, was a, it was a very good position, uh, but it wasn't where my, my passion was. Uh, about 10 years ago, I was able to get into our corporate social responsibility group, um, and that's really when I, I feel like I, I found my home and what's, uh, what, what, what was passionate to me. I started in our environmental work and then moved into our foundation. I should know this, but maybe seven or eight years ago, um, when, when you're having fun, you lose, you lose track of time, right? Um, but they, the point is it took me about, took for me about 20 years to really figure out exactly what it is that I, that I wanted to, to do, what, what I was passionate about. Uh, so a couple lessons that, I would, that I'll share with, uh, with, with Mike and Hannah and some of the others that, that I took away uh, really are patience, um, just stick with it, uh, perseverance, which is sticking with it. Uh, focus, uh, you know, do the best that you can regardless of, of what it is that you're doing. Um, seek out your passion. Uh, you know, some people will tell you, you know, find a job and you, your passions are separate, but I believe that you should try to do, combine them uh, to the extent that, that you can. It may take a while, um, you know, and, 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 and value the diverse skills that you get from wherever you're, 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 you're you're starting to work. You know, I still carry with me things that I learned as working in an ice cream shop in, in ninth grade. It was my very first job. Uh, you know, work hard and most importantly, um, uh, skill, I, the most important skill for me, I think, is just to never, ever quit. Just keep, keep going, keep going. So um, that is, uh, that is, those are my lessons there. And I think we're going to, have we, have we met Mike and Hannah yet? No, I'm, I'm going to introduce. No. Yeah, yes, that would be great. Okay. Uh, so, um, Mike, uh, Mike, are you there? Yes. You want to say hi so we can see you? Uh, hello, everybody. I'm Michael Kirby, um, upcoming junior at Ben Harbor High School. I've been in JMG for two years now. It's gonna be my third year. And hello. Yep. We can hear you. And, and Hannah, you there? Yep, I'm here. Okay. Um, you want to I'm Hannah Buck. I am an oncoming junior at Lenora High School. Um, yep. Hi. Hi. Okay, so Hannah, I'm going to turn it to you because you uh, you're going to you're going to you're going to start asking some some questions of me. Right. So my question for you is: Are you looking for anything in specific when you're hiring new or young people into your company? Yes. Great question, Hannah. So it's uh, you know AT and T is huge. We have two hundred and forty thousand people uh, around the country and around the world. Uh, so we look for, you know, different jobs. We'll have, uh, we're going to have different skill sets that we're that we're looking for. Um, we heard we heard earlier. Sonia was uh, talking about soft skills. We like to, uh, you know, so, so we like to refer to them as power skills. Um, there you are, Hannah. Uh, so the, that 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 is something that I, I, I cannot impress upon you and Mike enough that you know make sure that you are comfortable and have those those skill sets. Um, you know, the, cause what we, what we want to be able to do is we want to be able to find people who are able to think, um, because, you know, in, in any sort of job, uh, things change constantly, uh, different people have different types of questions. So you, you need to be able to, to think on your feet and, and, um, and, and adjust, uh, and, and to, to address problems. Um, teamwork, teamwork is absolutely critical. Right, because I, I think you know you guys may you and Mike, you haven't been in the workforce very very long, but you may have a sense that oh, once you get into a job, you just sit in a at a desk and do your thing by yourself. But I can tell you, every single job I've ever had has required uh, 
have people to work together towards towards a common goal. Uh, collaboration, uh, that's an, another skill set. So kind of going back to those the soft skills or the power skills, the ability to, to really work well with others. Uh, and technical skills. Um, you know, you guys are, you know, we, we experienced early, earlier my inability to handle uh, digital and technical skills, but, you know, you guys are, you guys have an advantage over many of us in that um, you, you're what's called digital natives. You grew up working, you know, technology. Uh, so that's something that, that should, should come very naturally to you. Uh, and then uh, lastly, I would just say, uh, a desire to have uh, to constantly learn, right? So, you know, you may think, oh, well, I'm about to finish school. I don't need to learn anymore, but, but you, you do. You just, you constantly need to absorb, to learn, to keep, keep, keep that knowledge base, uh, base going. I hope, that, I hope that answered it for you. Yeah, definitely, thank you. Okay, great, great. So I'm gonna, to ask you guys some questions. So I'll start with, uh, start with Mike. Um, you know, what are, what are you, some of your, your interests and your hobbies? I mean, we know, we know where you go to school, we know what age you are, but tell us a little bit about what some, some of your, your interests and hobbies and after school activities. Um, I can say some of my interests and hobbies are sports and I've been playing sports since I was pretty much a little kid really. And it really means a lot to me because it's like, something I can do to get out the house. And something else mm -hmm. that I like to do is go to the teen center that we have down here and interact with other people, and play with my friends and stuff. Okay. Anna, what, how, about, how about you? Um, I play music. I um, can play almost every instrument. I was in band mm -hmm. um, and orchestra and in choir throughout school. Um, and I like to draw and write and do all the creative things. Excellent. Yeah, those are uh, those are those are all valuable skill sets. So, there, so to, as you guys are thinking through your your careers, you know there are there are lessons that you can take away from from both of those, right? So, Mike, you're you're you like you like uh, sports. I think you I think you mentioned before you baseball and football, I believe. Uh, you know, those are, those are, they're, they're, they're skills from there that you can definitely apply to your, to your, to your, your, your future work. Uh, Hannah, I mean, with, with, you know, your creativity with music and drawing and, and writing, same, same thing. A lot of that can be applied to, uh, to, to your, to your future work. So talk a little bit as we're talking work, right? I shared my entire uh, career with you guys, you guys, uh, Talk a little bit to us. Um, tell us about you know what what careers you're 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 interested in, and some of the skills that you're that you're learning. So um, Anna, let, let's start. Oh, Mike, go ahead. You started. So we'll go with you. <laughs> um, I could say a career that I want to pursue. My my long life dream was to go to the NFL, but if something doesn't work out or injuries may happen, I could say I want to be a sports trainer athletic trainer or just have some way to keep going with football and the way that I can say that I'm getting there or any skills that I'm practicing to get there will have to be like some, some of the classes that I take in high school, like chemistry or anything that can help me learn human, the human body, I guess. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's like anatomy, chemistry, all, all yeah. of that. Great. Thank you. Hannah, how about you? Um, I really would like to go into social work or therapy or something that has to do with the way the mind works. I've been all my life, I've been so interested in the way that the mind works and how people feel and how people think and the process of it. And I think learning like communication and patience and all those soft skills or power skills, like you called them, that's really going to help me get towards um, where I want to go. Awesome, right? Because with your, you know, your, your social work, it's a, it's a great endeavor. My, my mom was a social worker her, uh, her entire career. Uh, so I, I've seen it up, up close and personal and how much uh, of a difference that it, that it can make. So yeah, I mean, those are, you know, those, those ability to, to listen to others, to sense what they're, 
what they're thinking and what their needs are. Uh, Mike, same thing, same thing with you, right? I mean, there's, there, you're talking about some of the, you know, chemistry and anatomy and, um, you know, being a, a sports trainer or involved with sports somehow or another, if you don't make it to the, uh, to the NFL, those are, those are all skill, valuable skill sets that will apply to, uh, apply to that. So when you guys are, you know, I know you're you're both uh, sociable. Mike, you talked about liking to hang out at the at the tech at the teen center. Um, you know, what would you what would you tell your peer? What do you what would you tell? What would you, if you had the chance to talk to them about you know their futures and what you're learning through uh, through JMG? Tell me a couple of things that you would talk about. Tell them. Um. Really, what I would just tell them, I would just tell them try to pursue their dream to their fullest and always try to work hard for what they want. And graduating high school would always be the first step to get to whatever dream that you want to pursue or whatever kind of job you want to have. And um, JMG can really help that too. Yeah. Right, because their 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 curriculum is all built on on everything you just talked about. Uh, Hannah, how about you? I really just tell them to focus on themselves. You know, when you're in high school and you're just going through your life, it's so difficult to make sure you're taking care of yourself and taking care of your mind and your body and. I really tell them to focus on themselves and to make sure they're doing okay, you know? Yeah. Hannah? Yeah. We got a question from the audience um, where somebody was asking if you think your time in JMG has encouraged your choice of that occupation and what you were just talking about, focusing on yourself and thinking about what skills you need. Has JMG really taught that out or like taught that to you? Um, yeah, actually, I, when I was um, in freshman year and I first came to Windover and AMG was one of my classes, um, they, they really talked about what we wanted to do when we got older. And they all told us that it's okay if you don't know, it's okay if you have different pathways that you want to look up, but we had to do a lot of research as a project. We have big project where we did a whole career research and it really, really helped me figure out why and what I really wanted to do. All right. Great. All right. Well, I, uh, uh, Mike and Hannah, thank you so much for, for taking the time to, to chat with me and, and answer questions from me. So it was great to get to know you guys and we are looking forward to who and what you become. Um, so I'm going to hand it back to Liz. Liz. Yes. Thank you, um, Kellum, and for Hannah and Mike for those answers. We really wanted to have a chance to talk about like what it feels like to be a JMG student, and we think that was a really good example. I am going to turn it back over to Sonia to just sort of um, tell, tell us a little bit more about JMG, but wanted to remind you that Mike and Hannah are here for the full webinar, and we can ask them more questions um, later on in the agenda. So, Sonia, if you want to take it away. Thanks, Liz. Um, as we lead into the themes of the case study, I want to share that Youth Solutions has recently completed a comprehensive strategic planning process. Um, our work with America's Promise Alliance on the Grad Nation Accelerator Initiative was one of our consideration points for the development of our plan. Uh, two of our priorities for the next five years connect to the themes of this webinar. First, we'll go all in on partnerships that expand and deepen services, leading to community level impact for vulnerable youth. And second, we plan to build an open entry, open exit model that accelerates post-secondary and career pathways and leads to sustainable employment. It is clear that two themes that America's Promise Alliance highlighted in the recent Comprehensive Pathways case study, um, including connected, connecting academics to post-graduation pathways and engaging employers with intentionality are core elements of the Youth Solutions Plan.
Thank you for sharing that, Sonia. And I think um, this is a good transition into what we're going to be talking about next, which are really our case studies. And so one of the reasons we wanted the young people on uh, Hannah and Mike on our webinar today, as well as all the partners you're going to hear from, is because a lot of our work on these case studies um, was talking about really how we're supporting young people through these post-secondary pathways. So we just wanted to root everyone in what the case study is. It's about 10 pages if you have a chance to read it. And I think we've shared the link in the Q&A and chat box. But this brief about responsive pathways highlighted about four themes that we saw across the different sites focusing on their pathways programming. So we learned that many of these lessons also translated directly into actions you could take in your own communities. And we'll be talking about that a little bit towards the end. But the four themes in the brief are making explicit connections between academics and post-secondary pathways, being sure not to conflate, conflate post-secondary with college. There's a ton of other opportunities. Um, holistically supporting youth needs and addressing any external barriers that may prevent them from succeeding and building relationships with employers in the community. So today with JMG Youth Solutions and their partners, we're going to highlight two key pieces of these broader themes. The importance of connecting the high school experience with academic um, and post-secondary planning and the critical need to build relationships with employers. So first, I think we should spend a few minutes on our key lesson around connecting academic experiences to post-secondary pathways. Youth Solutions zeroed in on a question that many young people often have. What purpose do my classes have in the context of my future? We saw the focus on purpose across sites. It was crucial that young people understood that their time in high school is something they need to connect to their career. What they learn in class time and out of school time can and should connect them and give them a path to what they will need in the future. Programming that gets that purpose is oftentimes viewed as extra or something that adults should not need to explain to young people. But in a changing economy, particularly one that includes the gig economy and entrepreneurship, both of which are increasingly enticing to young people, what we do inside the classroom has to be explicitly and intentionally connected to life outside of it. For example, we heard that many high school students report not seeing the connection between algebra homework and their future real life. Other students may lose patience with English because poetry doesn't seem like it leads to a career. What we heard was that our sites were really excellent at providing exposure to all of these post-secondary opportunities and pathways and that explained how that exact academic content would actually be relevant in their future careers. Math can lead you to engineering. English can lead you to a career in publishing. To match these connections, they also spent instructional time teaching explicit workplace readiness skills. Sites also provided career exploration activities during class time and out of school events. These exploration activities allow young people to ask, what do I need to do to get to these types of careers? So a key element in this work is that adults must present and promote a range of post-secondary opportunities to the youth that they're supporting. Two and four year colleges, certificate programs, apprenticeships, internships, and other work-based learning opportunities should all be presented as available to students. Programs like the one Youth Solutions leads provide time with knowledgeable adults to build out these responsive pathways with each young person and identify the career of a student's choosing. We noticed across sites that they did not prioritize one particular option and they did not stigmatize other options. This culture around post-secondary planning is really critical for guiding young people to find the path that is most suited to their own goals and dreams. I'm gonna hand it back to Sonia now. Thanks, Liz. Um, with connecting academics to pathways, we are working to ensure all Michigan youth under our care graduate prepared for post-secondary training and are provided with supported pathways to success in employment. We have an extended view of post-secondary training that includes both degree attainment and credentialing in partnership with college or an employer. We're excited that Michigan's governor, Gretchen Whitmer, announced a commitment to pathways at the start of our first term in office, aligning our state with the Lumina Foundation goal of 60% degrees or credentialing for all Michiganders by 2030. As a part of in this goal, Jobs for Michigan's graduates is working to increase our credential attainment from 30% to 50% in five years, with the intent to reach 60% by 2030. Our efforts to increase this are reflected in the strategic plan goals. As Liz shared, it's important to reinforce the need to finish high school and learn about post-secondary and career pathways while in school. 
getting a diploma was important pre-COVID and is, is even more important now. 61% of all jobs lost as a result of COVID were among those workers without any post-secondary education, despite them representing only 31.5% of the pre-COVID labor force. If we look back to the Great Recession, concrete data shows that recovery favors the educated. 11.6 million jobs were created in the seven years after the Great Recession ended. Of these, 11.5 million, or 99%, went to workers with some form of post-secondary education. Equally important is the exposure to careers and to finding one that matches youth's interests and skill sets. It is critical to understand how youth define life goals and to help them understand how to achieve them. With post-secondary and career pathway efforts as a significant part of our strategic plan, we are proud to partner with Michigan College Access Network, known as MCAN, and their executive director, Ryan Fewens Bliss, on this work. Ryan, can you speak to some of the efforts that Youth Solutions and MCAN are working on in tandem around connecting academics to pathways to ensure young people graduate from high school and enter post-secondary education or employment with credentialing? Yeah, thanks, Sonia. Thanks for having me. Uh, I have to say, uh, I have a long history of working with America's Promise. It was one of the first conferences I went to when I was a 17-year-old youth, the kickoff conference in Michigan, and was able to hear General Colin Powell uh, the following year when he came to Michigan. So it's a real honor to bring that full circle with you all today. MCAN is a statewide intermediary nonprofit organization trying to increase post-secondary readiness participation and completion, particularly among three populations, students of color, first generation college going students and low income students. Our work and our partnership with JMG uh, has evolved over time and is continuing to strengthen. In fact, I'm here in their office today because we presented them with a $10,000 check to celebrate our 10th birthday uh, this morning. So. We just thoroughly believe in their work and their connection between high school and career and college. Uh, I, I like to think of our work together as about access, as about getting students enrolled, uh, and then once they're enrolled, persisting and completing in post-secondary, like you heard uh, from some of our speakers earlier. A couple of ex examples of this, we recently launched what we call the Roadmap to Opportunity, which is a video and, uh, and uh, handout uh, system, I guess, that uh, training that we give to uh, professionals who work with youth. And the, the point of this is to focus on stackable credentials. So those are credentials whose credits can be used to stack or more credits can be used to stack on top of those credits to get a further uh, credential in the future. Uh, we think that's really important that whatever credential students are getting, they, they need to be stackable and transportable so they're not pigeonholed into one thing at one industry in one business. So the Roadmap to Opportunity Project helps students understand uh, that they can start with a certificate at a community college or a, a trade institution in other states, and they can then build off from that if they want to keep going in their education and get an associate's degree and maybe a bachelor's degree and maybe a master's degree and beyond. And the materials talk to uh, the earnability of those credentials as students go up the ladder. Uh, and the video focuses on an employer, a community college, and a student uh, that tells their story. Uh, it's been a really great piece. We've uh, published seven of them and we're about to publish five more uh, in fall of 20 and spring of 21. Uh, and JMG has really infused the roadmap to opportunity within their programming, so helping it be part of their curriculum and working with their students. Uh, they're also obviously working on this pathway, this pipeline idea, how we make sure students first complete high school and then decide where they want to go for post-secondary. Uh, we use the term college to mean all post-secondary in Michigan, certificates, associate's degrees, bachelor's and beyond. So when you hear me use the term college, that's what I'm referring to. We really wanna make sure students are able to find the right match and the right fit for them. What's the right type of institution? What's the right geography for them? What's the right uh, program that they wanna go into? And we really believe that students should be provided the full menu of options and that adults in their life aren't removing options from the menu because they think it's best for the students. Well, you can't afford that school, so we're gonna take it off. You don't have the grades for that school, we're gonna take it off. We really believe the student needs to be prepared for 
wherever they want to go and they need to be the driving force. JMG agrees with that and really empowers their students to make those decisions uh, building along that pipeline and obviously focusing on pieces of or stages along the way to get students into post-secondary including completing college applications, writing essays, scholarship applications, and then we have a shared goal around FAFSA completion. We found that when students complete the FAFSA, they often find that they're eligible for aid that they didn't even know existed, uh, like the Pell Grant. And so that's a real game changer when students get a letter back from the federal government saying, hey, we've got some cash for you, you can actually get to college. And then finally, we're launching a, a new AmeriCorps program here in the, the late winter of 2020 called the Completion Corps, where we're placing college coaches on community college campuses all across the state who will really focus on that persistence and completion part. Uh, you've heard a couple of people mention it. If we just send people into post-secondary, send students into college and they stop out, they often end up with debt from the credits that they have taken, but no credential that will help them to get a job to pay off the debt. It's a really ugly place to be. There's about 26% of Michigan residents who have some college and no degree. So we wanna make sure once the students get there, especially youth that JMG works with, once they land on campus, that there's someone on campus to say, hey, I care about you. I mean, this is true America's Promise mentorship style, right? There are adults in your life who care about you and who are going to mentor you through the process. So we're going to put Completion Core members uh, around about 20 campuses across the state. And we're really excited to partner with JMG so that when their students land on campus, those Completion Core members, those coaches, will be able to wrap their uh, arms around the students just like JMG staff has done uh, in their high school career and in their transition to make sure they're successfully uh, transitioning out uh, with a credential with a certificate or degree afterward. Really excited about that initiative. Incredibly excited about our partnership with JMG. Uh, if you want to know more about uh, Michigan College Access Network, check us out at micollegeaccess.org. Happy to provide uh, support to all of you like we have JMG. They're just a stellar organization. Uh, happy to be with them today and thanks for including me. Thank you, Ryan. I also wasn't fully aware of your relationship to APA, so just really glad that you're here and maintaining um, these relationships with JMG and America's Promise. Um, I think that was a really good overview of really what it means to connect academic experiences to pathways, and I think your partnership speaks to the fact that you understand there needs to be a full system of supportive adults around these young people that help them see their future every step of the way. Um, and when it comes to relationships, we also think it's really important to talk about the next theme from the case study, which is the importance of building relationships with employers. So we found that across all of the sites, the critical importance of building trusting relationships with trusted employers, especially locally owned businesses and community leads, um, was really important for young people. Because the world of work can be confusing and difficult to enter, especially for youth who have not yet navigated a job application process or been in an interview. So sites built relationship with trusted employers so that young people could access an internship or a first job or a job shadow or even a coaching program to prepare for whatever their entry point would be for careers. These experiences were made possible because employers were committed to welcoming young people and providing them with meaningful working and learning experiences. I wanted to share a little bit of what we learned from our sites about what these relationship building experiences meant, and it really was um, about reciprocity. So sometimes um, the key element of these programs and employer relationships was about providing training and maybe an employer wanted to train a young person but didn't have the skills so a nonprofit would step in or a nonprofit or an agency could pay for the salary of a young person so that they could be hired by a company that didn't necessarily have the budget. So we just wanted to flag that it's really important to build relationships by providing capacity to employers and that was really what stuck for a lot of our sites. Um, and it was also important to know that a key central element for a lot of the programming was having young people build their relationships with employers too. So we had adult relationships and youth relationships. And I think that Elizabeth is gonna speak really well to the JMG aspect of youth um, employer relationship building. So I'm gonna turn it over to her, but this is just a really important second theme from the brief. Elizabeth, do you wanna take it away? Thank you. 
Uh, the employer engagement process is exactly that, a process for youth proceed through each phase, beginning broadly and narrowing down their post-secondary and career pathways as they progress through the model. It is deliberately a phased model. If you jump directly to experience, we aren't giving youth the opportunity to fully explore a plethora of careers or be exposed to them. The more touch points a youth gets with an industry, the better they can ascertain if it's a right fit for them. Because our specialists are in the schools on a daily basis, interacting and working with their youth, they develop a strong bond and the youth look to them for personal education and post-graduation advice. The employer engagement model is designed to be part of the daily curriculum in order to help youth decide and create their post-secondary pathway and for employers to get to know the youth over a long period of time. In the explore phase, youth take assessments to gauge their skills and interests. At this phase, they really are exploring who they are, considering their own values, their goals, strengths, and interests. They learn from researching a variety of careers, reviewing job descriptions, and examining the labor market data for their areas of interest. Expose is where they deepen their learning to more specific inf information about a job or industry. Examples include guest speakers, interactive business tours, or industry-designed learning events. The experience phase happens prior to high school graduation or GED attainment so that they gain real valuable work experience in their area of interest. Examples include job shadow, informational interviews, mentorship, and pre-apprenticeships. In addition, employers can participate as volunteers for youth events where they use the skills learned through JMG. An example of the employer engagement framework in action can be seen in our relationship with DTE. Youth explore opportunities at DTE from their classrooms and program sites by researching the company online, by viewing DTE job descriptions, and understanding the skills and education needed for different jobs at DTE. DTE professionals from different departments then visit the, the JMG program sites to, to talk about their own career pathways and respective roles. Interested students then visit DTE for a day of career exposure in which teams from diverse departments guide youth through a series of fun and hands-on job-related activities. Youth who remain interested in the career at DTE are then invited to participate in summer employment and or internships with transportation provided for by DTE, thus providing the experience portion of the framework. Lastly, for youth who are still interested in employment at DTE after going through all these steps, many choose to enroll in a one-year certificate program at Henry Ford Community College that was co-created by DTE. Upon successful completion of the program, many youth transition into full-time positions at DTE. So we've talked quite a bit about the impacts of COVID on our youth, on our employers, and on our world. The challenges we face, however, are also opening opportunities. For employers, building a 21st century talent pipeline requires three things. The first, we need to pivot existing employer engagement activities to virtual opportunities in order to reach youth where they are today. Second, we need to broaden the age range to begin the exploration phase as early as middle school, when youth disconnection from education begins. And third, we need to connect employers to youth around the state, not just to youth who are located in their immediate vicinity. So virtual talent tours are becoming a primary engagement path due to COVID-19. This fall, JMG Youth will participate in Manufacturing Week here in Michigan. For youth in Southeast Michigan, Monday through Thursday, employers will deliver videos to the classrooms talking about their companies and the job opportunities available. They'll give a virtual tour of their facilities and talk with youth about the importance of an education. On Friday, there will be a question, question and answer session with all the employers and the youth to start the relationships that will eventually fill the talent pipeline employers need the most. So employers are recognizing that they need to invest their time with youth early and often, and they need to stay with them through high school so that the youth gain the skills and the work experiences to be ready for the jobs available. The more time a youth has to learn and grow with a company, the more committed to the company they will be.
Liz, back to you. Thanks, Elizabeth. That was super helpful to un really unpack and understand what it takes to get that mutual connection uh, between a nonprofit, a school, and a business, which can seem a little daunting. But um, in the last few years, as part of the Grad Nation campaign, we've seen an increased uh, desire for that type of partnership. And I've been wanting this part of the discussion to happen since I joined America's Promise over three years ago. So thank you for helping to, to fill that content for the campaign with some real examples. So we're, we also have a close relationship, uh, a corporate sponsor through AT&T, and we heard from Callum earlier in the session. So I'm gonna invite Callum back now to, uh, and I'm gonna give Hannah and Mike this warning too, to come off mute. And we want to, given everything we've discussed uh, related to connecting academics to post-secondary pathways, and what we've heard about engaging employers, Want to come back to Hannah and Mike and hear how you all processing all of this in this pretty unprecedented time with the twin pandemics. Um, and if you could share sort of like, is everything transitioning virtually or not? So I'm going to kick it over to Callum, uh, Hannah and Mike to share a little bit about how all of this looks now. Yep. So uh, the, you can hear me, I assume. Yeah. Okay. Great. All right. Well, Hannah, Mike, you know, we, we know we've, we've dealt with the the, the, uh, the COVID shutdown uh, where you guys have had to go to school uh, remotely um, for the since March, as you well know. Um, you know, as along with the with George Floyd's killing recently, can you t talk about uh, talk about how COVID has really impacted your your education and and, and your ability to uh, to work? What sort of impact does that have? So, let's, Mike, let's start with you. Um, really, COVID hasn't impacted the way I work because I've been working at my job for Bur at Burger King for about two, three weeks now. So it really hasn't impacted the like how I work, but I can say it's impacted my like me as a as a, in a learning perspective positively because it's like it's more on me to if I want to learn this class or if I want to find out the next step and I can reach out for help if I need it because I'm more of an independent worker. Mm -hmm. Great. That's, uh, that's, that's a good positive outlook. Anna, how about you? Um, well, for me personally, finding a job was very, very difficult for me. Um, it was really, really hard for me to find someone who would hire me having little bit of experience. Um, I've done a few things under the table, you know, because like I've worked at the local fair and I was a dishwasher at um, a family owned uh, restaurant. Um, but personally, I couldn't find a job for a very long time. I just recently actually got a job at KFC um, maybe a week ago. So that was, uh, that's my like first official job where I've worked. So um, it's really hard for me to um, find that and find someone who would hire me with like no experience. And with Great. school, it was, um, Really, the transition to the online school is really difficult for me because I have, I have a hard time disciplining myself to sit down and do my work and do what I need to do. Okay. Well, thank you for thank you for sharing and congratulations on your uh, on your new job. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's, that's awesome. Uh, it's interesting. You guys have had different experiences as far as the you know how working uh, school remotely has impacted you. Could you? Talk a little bit, um, both of you guys, about how your specialists um, have supported you um, during this time, and, you know, through school and through, through work. Talk a little bit about that. So, Hannah, we'll, go, we'll start with you. Um, it has helped me so much in the pandemic and all of the things that have been going on recently. She is always reaching out to me and always asking me if I need any help or if I need to get out or if there's any way for her to um, push me to do something. She'll do her best to 
um, push me what I, to, to do what I need to do and to uh, um, make sure that I'm on schedule and on track with all of my work and school and um, she she's taking me out for ice cream next week as a reward for all of the things that I do. So there's that. Awesome. Mike, how, how about you? Um, my specialist has been very much, very helpful for me because he took me to go get my um, work permit signed at my high school. He really pretty much helped me look for the job and pretty much just giving me confidence that I know that I can do this and stuff like that. Excellent. So they, it sounds like they are, they are an integral part of that whole connection between school and, and work um, that, that, uh, that we've been talking about. Well, again, thank you guys for, for sharing all that. It's, it's, uh, uh, we do, we do appreciate it and um, you know, keep, keep at it. Just keep at it. It'll, it'll get better because it sure can't get worse than we are right now. Um, so I'm, I'm going to turn it back to, uh, turn it back to Liz. Monica. I'm going to jump in. Yeah, bye. Thanks, Kellum. Thank you, Mike and Hannah, for sharing your perspectives and what you're experiencing right now. It's certainly a very weird time for all of us and um, just want to commend you on your resilience and your adaptation in this time uh, when everything is virtual. It, it, though it sounds like you can go in for your jobs, <laughs> um, though I'm sure it looks a little bit different uh, even still. So thank you so much. Um, we, you know, throughout this webinar have shared a number of foundational lessons from across these acceleration sites. And we recognize that every community is in a different place to be able to act. But we really think these strategies centered on connecting academics to pathways and on developing and cultivating those employer relationships can be implemented in any community. So we wanted to share a few next steps about how you can build responsive pathways to post-secondary life. Each one can be done on its own, but as you can imagine, when you have a strong partnership like the one shown today between Youth Solutions, Jobs for America's graduates, and MCAN, the impact on young people is greater. So one of the next steps is really just to intentionally create time for bringing work experiences into the school week. Of course, this involves scheduling and staff capacity, and it requires connections with people outside the school system. This could mean inviting community leaders and employers to speak about what is needed to succeed in the workplace. It could also mean forging partnerships to create work-based learning opportunities. And over the course of a school year, young people can begin with an inventory and then move on to those internship experiences later in the school year. Another key next step for any community really is to bring young people back to school who have left. Re-engaging young people who leave without graduating isn't easy and it's not a simple next step, but it's a powerful one. Young people who are not in school or not working are often in need of the most support to find education training and career pathways that fit their needs. And working with them to return and earn that high school diploma through alternative means or in the traditional classroom is critical outreach that empowers young people to explore their own next steps. I wanna particularly underline this one in this time with COVID and remote learning. There's a huge risk that we're going to lose young people in this process. And so re-engagement needs to be re-upped, if you will, as a priority. A third next step is to build relationships with employers and encourage them to welcome and support young people in their workspaces. As Liz described earlier and as Elizabeth uh, explained after that, these partnerships really evolve from a mutually beneficial commitment to support business needs and build young people's skill sets. It's often rooted in a sense of civic duty and giving back to the community that serves as customers. So start relatively small. Start with informational calls to find opportunities to work together or ask your local employers about what their capacity gaps are and how they might be filled. Once you determine what they need, and how young people might be able to contribute to that, you can move forward to more robust programming and training. So 
we've got a few last remaining minutes and we do have quite a few questions in the chat box. So I'm going to kick it over to Liz, who I believe has uh, got a few questions in mind. And we're gonna go ahead and stop screen sharing. Is that right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. shift to questions. Okay, and some of these questions are for Hannah and Mike. So I just want, and, and I think others are for the JMG team. So just wanna put you all on alert. Uh, we'll, we'll try to be specific about who's got the question. Thanks, Monica. And we wanna encourage all of you to continue sending questions, but we do have a few. And the first one, um, we really wanna ask for Sonia, Kristen, anyone from the JMG team, because quite a few people are interested. If you could talk about the recruitment process um, for encouraging young people to join JMG. And then after you go through that, if Hannah or Mike, you wanna talk about what led you to decide to join JMG, I think that could be a nice follow-up to um, their description. Thanks, Liz. Um, yeah, I think it, it depends on, on the school, really, um, you know, and, or the length of the program, too, um, or how long the program's been at the school. If it's a new program, um, the, the school counselors will look and see um, who they believe would be the best fits and assign kids. If it's a, it's a program that's been around a while, um, like the Benton Harbor program, um, I, I think kids are... <laughs> are um, itching to get in the class because um, the, the, their specialists are the coaches. Um, and they know that um, people like Mike are in it and Mike talks about it and they hear good things and they wanna join too. Um, we do have an advisory council made up of the specialists, um, somebody from the school, usually the school counselor, um, and and then some other folks in the community that help to really identify youth if that's a need as well. Thank you. I know Hannah and Mike, you're free to answer if you want to talk about sort of what led you to join JMG and when you started. Um, I started, I can say my freshman year and the way I joined it, y'all was in the eighth grade and then Fortunately, Danny had came up to the middle school at lunchtime and really he just walked around with a, a pen and some paper and said, who wants to join JMG? So me and my friend just like, it could be a fun class, we could see what it's about. So we joined it and it actually turned out to be fun. That's great. Word of mouth seems to be working really well. <laughs> Do you want to share, Hannah? You don't have to. Um, I was going to say that when I went to Wendover, I switched schools. See, Wendover is an alternative school, so it's a school of choice. So when I um, was in middle school, I would have gone to our local high school, but I decided that it was too big. So I, would, I switched over to Wendover, and I was immediately just placed into the class. And so um, I got a feel for it, and I got... Um, I, had, I made friends in that class, and um, ever since, I've always picked it on my schedule, so. I'm glad it's having such a positive impact. Um, I do want to switch over just to talk Elizabeth. We have a question. You shared such a good overview of what this explore and employer engagement model looks like, but a couple of people are just wondering, like, first time, they're a nonprofit. They want to help employers get connected to students. Can you give some tips on like relationship building strategies when you're really starting at that base level of not really knowing each other? Sure, absolutely. So employers have a self-interest in investing in their future talent pipeline. And it used to be maybe five years ago that employers were a little bit trepidatious about looking at working with younger youth. At first, they seemed to be interested in working in the, with those who are maybe 18, 19 years old, those who are interested in graduation. That's changed. Now they have an interest in investing in youth at a younger and younger age. I just met with a very large company yesterday and they were so excited to hear about our program. And they said, I love that you are looking at moving down to the middle school model because that's who we know we have to be investing in. So even though that future reward is off in the future, and what I mean by that is talent pipeline, they know that they have to invest now to get the youth of tomorrow into their door. And so it's a win-win. Employers have a vested interest in this. It's an easy sell. And they, most companies, especially now, have a very strong commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. 
and our youth are a very attractive option for this because it really helps them access a population that they don't typically have access to. And em employers are very interested in mentoring our young people and providing them with professional networks because it really helps them build their, pi their pipelines. Thank you. I think that's such a good point is that also like when you know, employers really understand that young people are going to be their future employees and really contributing to their culture. It's important to invest um, early. I know that we have heard a little bit about re-engaging young people who've left high school without graduating. And Sonia, I know you mentioned at the top that there's some out of school time programming and out of schools for students who aren't in the classroom. Can you talk a little bit more about some of the key strategies you employ um, to re-engage youth, but also in this COVID context, if you've shifted any of your re-engagement strategies? Um, we are really connected with our workforce system. So um, what we call the Michigan Works here in Michigan. Um, so that's one of our ways to get connected with young people who have um, left high school or with young people who maybe have graduated but aren't employed or going to school right now. Um, with, with the shift to um, everything being virtual and the Michigan Works or the workforce system shutting down um, and not having in-person, um, not being able to get people coming in their doors anymore, um, it has shifted a bit. Um, and it, that's been a struggle honestly, is identifying young people who have um, or who are disconnected and um, we don't know where they're at right now um, because they're not able to go anywhere. Um, so we're, we're working through a lot of that um, and, and there's not a real easy answer for, for that right now. Um, but I do know, just for example, um, some of the adult education providers have a lot of young people who um, you know, have left traditional high school and are deciding to go back to get their GED or equivalent, high school equivalent. And, and so that's a way that we can come in and work with adult education providers um, because we do see that some of those youth are, are engaging there or even if they have engaged in the past um, and maybe aren't anymore, we can, we can try to get in touch with them to, to re-engage them and get them going again. That's really helpful. And I think I would just echo you're not alone with the fact that there's a lot of young people who we uh, are struggling to find in this time. And so I, I do want to share with everyone who's with us on the webinar and everyone on the panelists that I think being able to identify young people who need our support is still a critical priority. And it is a bit of a challenge right now. So don't be afraid to talk to your partners about ways to try to work together to support them. Um, I think we have one last question, and this is really for the Job Your Michigan's graduates team, but I think um, a lot of people are wondering, like, what advice do you have for people who would be wanting to implement pathways programming? So really getting young people connected to their post-secondary plan um, in school or in a, you know, after school program or kind of thing. What would be some advice for those programs? I, I'll start, and I, I think then maybe some other people might have some other thoughts, but I, I think it's really important to um, bring it back to the youth. Ask the youth what it is that they want to do. Um, you know, what are, what are their life goals after high school? And really get them thinking about um, what they want their lives to look like. You know, do they want to own a home? Do they want to have a nice car? Um, do they want to have a family? How much is that going to cost? Um, what are your interests? And then, and then try to match those up. So, so you know that um, what they're, they're working towards is, um, matches their life goals as well. And I'll jump in there. When we surveyed our youth last fall, we asked them what they appreciated the most about JMG. And when I went to the survey results, I was expecting them to say things like, we love the events. We loved the kind of field trip kind of experiences. But no, they spoke to the fact that JMG prepares them for the careers of tomorrow and we help them understand who they are and we connect them to diverse jobs. And that was really amazing to me to see is that what we're really giving them is what they want. 
And so we're committed that long before they get their high school diploma or their GED, that they have a grounded plan that tells them that they've devised that will determine where they will go once they have their high school diploma or GED. So before graduation, they will connect with employers. They will personally reach out to them. They will ask for mentorship. They will ask questions. They will go to educational institutions. They will tour campuses and they will find out which institutions in their region or their state or perhaps even out of Michigan is the best fit for them. But they're excited about it. This is an easy sell because youth want to know who they want to be when they grow up. And they don't want us to tell them, they want to find it out for themselves. So really start with those assessments and those self-awareness pieces. I don't think we could have asked for a better uh, ending in terms of next steps and advice. I think starting with the young people we serve absolutely makes the most sense. So I want to personally thank Mike and Hannah for joining and um, see if you have anything you want to add to what you just heard about advice or what you're looking forward to in this next year um no nothing really just thank you for having me and i wish everybody uh, a good rest of the year hannah any any final thoughts all right well, thank you to Mike and Hannah. Thank you to the whole G G GMG team, sorry, JMG team. And really appreciate you sharing all of your success, your data, your challenges, and how you've worked through them. And um, wish you continued success. Appreciate Ryan joining as well. Uh, thanks also to this really great audience. Your, the, your activity in the chat was great and we hope that your questions were answered and encourage you to uh, look continue to look at JMG's programming. That's all we have for today. Um, thanks so much for joining. We will be sending a link following this webinar with the recording and the slide deck uh, for you to share with your other colleagues and friends. Thanks so much and we do have uh, the final webinar in this series is September 24th and we invite you to register and join us for that one. Thanks so much. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everyone.